Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, all right. Because uh, I'm going to start beatboxing in a minute. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, now that the lights are dim, I, can, uh, I no longer can see my shame and I can do this performance. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, there's so many artists I really respect here. It's uh, a huge honor to look out at, uh, thankfully, a sea of darkened faces. Um, and thank you to the Studio School for inviting me and having me and, and Leanne for that uh, uh, kind introduction. Um, I, I just had this one up here. I, I became a father last fall. I, my daughter is five months old, and I made this drawing uh, like a year before as I contemplated uh, being, being a dad. So that's me uh, with my uh, serpentine uh, hand. Uh, okay, now down to business. Um, I, I often start with this large drawing. It's a, uh, three big sheets of paper. It's about 17 feet across, um, and it's a uh, a drawing called About Midnight Saturday. Part of the, the piece is also the sculpture in the foreground that you see. Um, and I'll uh, talk about that in a moment. Um, this drawing was the culmination of a few years, uh, about two years, of doing nothing but drawing, having given up oil painting. And uh, it, it um, marked a big shift in how I make the work that I make. Um, so. Uh, this is based on an interview that I did with my father. My sister and I both uh, conducted the interview. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's, he's taking my seat. It's OK. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's Greg. You can take my seat. Um, so my sister and I conducted this interview with my father um, about uh, this really central event in his life. In 1970, on Christmas evening, around midnight, uh, he and a friend uh, were driving home from a double date in Kansas, and they were, uh, I'm from Missouri, from Kansas City, Missouri, and he grew up there as well, um, and they would go to, uh, uh, they'd go on dates in Kansas because the drinking age was younger. Um, so they were there, uh, as he put it, getting hot dogs and beer, and they are driving back, and they were driving in this brand new cherry red uh, 1970 Z28 Camaro that you see on the right. and. They dropped off uh, one of their dates, um, so there were just the three of them in the car, and they pulled up behind this Buick Riviera that you see, and uh, they were about a, a mile and a half from his friend's home, which is where they were headed. And they pulled up behind the car, he was driving very slowly, um, and my father was driving, he flashed his lights at the car, thinking they were looking for a party, um, and he just wanted them to speed up. When they didn't, he uh, pulled around them, it was a little two-lane uh, uh, road, at the next intersection, the car had pulled up beside him, and it, it looked like they wanted to drag race. And he was not uh, unfamiliar with uh, late night illicit street racing. So as he put it, he put the pedal to the floor and didn't get out of uh, second gear, um, just, just burning rubber all the way to his friend's house. Um, the Riviera pulled in beside him uh, when they got there, and he thought, oh, this is strange. This isn't uh, what I expected. And he got out and he went to the passenger side uh, window, um, which uh, the guy rolled down. He didn't see the guy's face. It was in shadow. Um, but what he saw was a flash of light uh, glinting off the blade of what the police later referred to as a carnival knife. And he swung at the blade and didn't realize he was stabbed. Um, but knew that something was wrong, yelled to his friends to get inside. He ran into the house and uh, tore the screen door off its hinges um, his, because of the adrenaline rush. Um, and he ran inside into the midst of the party that his friend's sister was throwing and collapsed on the ground. He'd been stabbed in the heart. Um, he lived. It's OK. Um, this was 1970. I'm not that old. Um, but. Uh, Fortunately, his friend's sister was a nurse at the ER. She could call ahead to have a cardiac surgeon there, and basically she saved his life. They never caught the guy who did it um, because he never got a clear look at his face. They had suspects, um, uh, a lot of different suspects, and I'll, if there's time, I'll show you the police report later, um, or a painting of the police report. Um, but he was never found. And so this became a kind of formative myth in my family because my father, who's had four heart surgeries, has uh, huge kind of Frankenstein-looking scars all over his chest. And any time we would go to the community pool, um, we would see uh, you know, this, this evidence of the crime that happened. Um, 
So anyway, that's when you're looking at this drawing, you hear my father telling this story, and he's a really good story table t teller. It's a an engrossing uh, story, and at, at one point he he gets very emotional. It's um, you know, he's very involved, um, but none of the characters are there in the drawing. So you, as the audience, are kind of a, uh, a kind of mental projector, projecting visualized versions of what he's talking about onto the, the drawing that you see, this kind of blank stage. Um, so there's a detail of what the sculpture looks like. There's an actual speaker inside of the sculpture of a speaker. And the, the sculpture is a replica of a cabinet speaker my dad had around this time and that uh, I had in high school and now my sister has. All these objects sort of drift around. Um, and so you're kind of puzzling through all the details. You have all the evidence, um, but none of the, the actors. And the form of the drawing, these three big pages, um, was partially because I saw uh, the work of Don Clements. Um, and it, it blew my mind. Um, some of the most amazing, um, draw, not just drawing, but art you'll ever see. Um, and she will frequently work on a kind of unusually shaped uh, uh, surface that will get folded and moved around. Um, and for my story, I was interested in having these kind of absent spaces, you know, where the pages don't quite line up. Um, I also had just made an artist book that had a series of gatefold uh, pages. And so I was interested that my huge drawing should also unfold the way that um, the triptychs in these books would. So um, leading up to that drawing, I... Um, as I as I had mentioned, had quit oil painting. I had stopped working from photographs directly. I had started instead um, uh, making drawings where I'd have to just look at the blank page and then try to take what was going on inside my imagination and put it out on the page. Um, that would often involve doing image research, but everything would get funneled through my drawing. So I would draw from life. I would draw from my head in my sketchbook. I would draw from uh, JPEGs to get specific pictorial evidence. Um, I would draw from TV shows. Um, and then that would all get compiled in the, in the actual drawing itself. Um, so this is a, um, because of that, a, a lot of the time I found myself working from memory and, and experiences that had happened to me. And so for the first body of work of these drawings, they were kind of, it was like my high school teen drama. Um, so they re reoccurred. So this is a drawing uh, called How to Personalize Your Locker. Um, which is based on a YouTube video by the same name. And the, one, the girl in the video is clearly talking to high schoolers uh, like myself who would have been kind of clueless, maybe under, underfriended. Um, and so she explains how to, um, to the socially inept, how to um, make a locker, you know, kind of passable. And so she says, you know, you should cut out pictures of your friends and you should tape them inside the locker so that you can see them there and, uh, when you open it. And if you don't have friends, you can cut out pictures of people from magazines and tape them in. And so anyway, this is, this is my version um, where, you know, there she is with her imaginary boyfriend um, in her locker, which is like this headspace where you can go and put your head in like an ostrich and leave all the shame behind. Um, it's also like a reverse of the kind of niche, uh, niche space in like uh, in the still life tradition. Um, so I, I like the idea that it was like a space to put your face instead of a space to kind of look in and contemplate. Um, and I was looking at things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, which is one of the great television shows. Uh, may maybe the start of the golden age of television that we're in. Um, and I loved how the, the high school was this place of condensation where many different kinds of life experiences and genres and everything get sort of compressed and mashed into one thing. Um, and in looking for stills uh, from Buffy, I actually realized I completely borrowed her haircut um, for that character, but just unconsciously. Um, when I moved out of making nothing but drawings, I wanted to make works in color that felt still drawn or st still highly constructed the way the drawings were because I would use, uh, I wouldn't use any kind of painterly techniques. I, would, I wouldn't use graphite powder or anything like that, um, even though that would be very sensible. Um, I will talk about a number of ways in which I am not sensible. Um, the, and, uh, and so I wanted something that felt equally sort of sculptural, chiseled and cobbled together. So I started, uh, uh, making these big collages. So they look like paintings, but they're all pieces of paper painted in flat colors and gradients that I cut apart and glued together on other big pieces of paper. So this is a f uh, five foot tall uh, cut paper collage called Locker Room, a sort of uh, uh, pubescent me, um, except I had glasses, um, and in, in a kind of embarrassing moment in high school of, of having to change his clothes in the locker room. Um, and moving back into color meant that I could I could do things that I was trying to do with mark making, which would be to like um, 
displace some of the psychological stuff the character was going through onto the color or the context. So it's like he's blushing, but really the whole wall of lockers is kind of blushing with him. So there's some details of that. But you know he's doing okay because he's got the Reebok pumps, right? So you kind of want to beat him up too. So, um, And then here, here's sort of the... the um, one version of the setting, using again this kind of gatefold idea. This, this one is uh, six feet tall, eight feet across, so two, three foot wide uh, panels, um, big pieces of paper. Um, and I, I frequently think in these kind of multi-frame formats um, because they allow me different kinds of, different moments of time to deal with in the work. So um, the kind of idealized, almost catalog version of the high school, and then the kind of, uh, you know, entropy is taken over, the school is abandoned, uh, not funded, uh, et cetera, and, and left to, to ruin. So I was using a little spray paint, but even that I was like, I'm gonna spray and then I'll cut out the spray painted mark because I needed it to be somehow more indirect. Um, and at the same time I was doing a lot of, uh, or some images of uh, book covers um, because I was thinking about like the sites of narrative um, so with the high school images, it was like narrative was a place. It was like the set on the sitcom that you could go to. And th with the book covers, it was like, okay, narrative is happening within uh, this kind of barrier. There's, I'm, I'm often placing some kind of wall between the viewer and the, the event. Um, and it also gave me an opportunity to, to like indulge in my love of the bad copy on the outsides of... Uh, uh, sci-fi novels and um, also the, uh, it, once, it, once it's a book cover I, I'm suddenly free to draw rocket ships and spacemen and things like that that I wouldn't have allowed myself to do otherwise. Um, the book cover is like the part of the book that says that it, it's trying to seduce you into the story but it also can't tell you the whole story so you get these interesting kind of compressed uh, narratives. Um, so I'm looking at things like this. Um, it's trying to seduce you. Can you tell? Um, what I think it makes, makes it an unusual love triangle um, is that they're twins, but wait, they're clones, because um, after she finished with the sheep, she made them. Um, and, and I think, you know, you can fill in the blanks. Um, I love the symmetry of this. I could just talk for the next, I'll just talk the rest of the time about this one. Um, so this is a collage that um, uh, is kind of my version, if I were making a novelization of a Douglas Sirk movie about falling in love with my wife, it would be this. Um, they also all have my own kind of pin names, so in this one I'm Margot Boucher. Um, and I feel like this is my best attempt at doing a Sirk-like a, a title, so every moment lives forever. Um, and it's a, all these works that were on paper were either very big or they're 22 by 30 or uh, 30 by 44, so this is one of the 30 by 44s. Um, so I'm looking at things like this. I'm thinking about the color that's in Cirque's kind of technicolor work. Um, and this, uh, this is from, uh, still from All That Heaven Allows, um, where uh, Rock Hudson and Jane Wyman um, are, this ki are this kind of uh, couple that can't, uh, that, are, that are fated, ill-fated. Um, and this is him showing her the orchard that he's, he's going to plant for her. But of course, the, the symbolism is abundantly clear that things aren't going to work out. Spoiler alert. Um, so this is my own version of looking out the window, except I'm from Missouri, so when you look out the window, this is what you get. Um, and this is another version of that kind of compression that really uh, makes images make sense for me. Um, I, if it were simply the view of the suburbs, it somehow wouldn't, that it doesn't, I don't get traction there. I need something that situates me as a kind of, uh, as a viewer in a, in a fictional outlook looking into that world. I also need something that's, that's, uh, that I have to kind of trip over, that I have to grapple with and hold on to so that I can get into the picture um, and you know, by way of something that's really physical. In, the, in this case, the life-sized uh, or even slightly bigger window frame. Um, this, one, this one's about 30 inches tall. Um, it's, uh, it's called Ditch. Uh, I, I wandered around a lot when I was uh, uh, a t like a teenager, and in, and in Gladstone, Missouri, there were no sidewalks, or there were very few sidewalks, and when you really wanted to get somewhere, you had to walk in the drainage ditch. Um, 
but I loved seeing the garbage that was in the drainage ditch. Um, I have a bad habit of going on a hike where there's beautiful stuff all around and then sitting down to paint and then like finding some hiker garbage to draw. Um, and I, I was interested in the way that this, this, these remnants were kind of evidence of a story um, that maybe I would never know, but that I could start to imagine. So this is kind of my version of that. Um, and it's part of what attracts me to uh, David Lynch's film, Blue Velvet. Um, can you see that that's a severed ear? Okay, um, you know, and you've all seen it, but uh, you know that uh, in in a, in a moment of tension where a father is in the hospital and the son is kind of wandering aimless back in his hometown, is these sorts of narratives that respond that I respond to. Um, the character Jeffrey finds an ear in a field, and then the camera sort of dives into the ear, which is overflowing with ants, and it's kind of like a gateway to the sort of underbelly of that that suburban world, um, and, I, and I'm. I love that. That moment of beginning with the most, like the, from the toes of your boots in the dirt, kind of mundane reality to the most transformative and fantastic, all compressed into one, uh, one moment, which I guess is what you get from those kind of gateway scenes um, where there's something you have to kind of pass through to enter. Um, so this is a, a kind of composite view of my parents' ranch, ranch home um, and with a slightly bigger than life-size chain link fence um, and I had the idea, so it's back to that idea of like an impediment, but I had the idea that um, I couldn't, I shouldn't just make a picture of the fence, I should cut a bunch of squiggly lines out of paper and then weave it like a huge textile and then make a picture of the, my parents' house and then just glue the fence on. Um, so I watched all of 30 Rock um, while weaving uh, a chain link fence at life size. Um, People ask me how long it takes to do things, and I'm, uh, that's, how I t that's how I know sometimes. Um, so this is a detail. So you can see that some parts of it have a kind of relief sculpture character, and it casts shadows. Um, so it needed to be sort of that, that real to me. Um, this, I, I, you know, I, I know I'm thinking about painting all the time, um, and I teach, uh, so I talk about painting all the time, and I'm always making paintings, and yet when I'm thinking about uh, references for my work, it's, it's often films and novels, um, I think because I'm so narratively wired. Um, this is a still from Kelly Reichardt's film, Wendy and Lucy, um, which aside from the fact that she's behind a fence and that was convenient, um, I was really interested in her character and I was making characters that were kind of like her character in this film, um, who en route to a job in Alaska, uh, ends up having car trouble her dog runs away, and then she goes broke. And so she's just sort of uh, stuck in between uh, the bad life that she was leaving and the good possibility to come. She's in this kind of limbo. Um, and I had been uh, moving from artist residency to artist residency, and I didn't sign a lease for five years, and I didn't live anywhere for more than seven months, um, which in some ways was really good for my work, and in other ways was really bad for me socially and, and in terms of my health, um, but whatever, it happened. Um, and so I did a whole bunch of paintings of, uh, or collages of characters who are kind of permanent house guests. Um, so this is a five foot tall uh, piece from that series. Um, and the color, the characters are kind of aging um, and the color had really shifted so that uh, uh, now the, instead of the kind of, it's all still heightened, but it has this kind of menace in it. There's something, it's like too hot, too, too sunny um, for anyone's own good. Um, this is a, the cover of a Kurt Cobain uh, notebook. Um, and uh, the facsimiles of these are fantastic. They're obviously made for public consumption. And even, you can tell from his uh, quote on the front, um, or his writing on the front. Um, and like the book covers, I was interested in notebooks as a kind of site for thinking. It's like, if for personal narrative, they're kind of a, an embodiment of it, may, maybe even more so than uh, our own bodies sometimes. Um, so I made some of my own versions of this. Um, so this one's overly, overly large, it's 44 inches tall, so the, the notebook itself is kind of torso scaled. Um, and it has this kind of sunburn uh, on it um, that's like right, right here, mid bicep. Um, and then I had a, 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 like a, I had a bad summer, um, and then I had the idea um, as a, as a, uh, for, as, a, as like a former Catholic schoolboy, that if I embodied that idea as an object 
um, in this case, this journal that I kept at the time, and then I exercised it uh, that all those bad memories would go away. Um, and it didn't work, but I, I, was, uh, I was very happy with the, the, the diptych, this kind of idea of just a simple like before and after. Um, and I, w I was looking at things like uh, the left is uh, David Mitchell's notebook, um, and he did uh, The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut and Cloud Atlas. Um, and on the right is the, uh, a scroll by Proust. It's a manuscript for Swan's Way. And I, was, I became captivated in the idea that their notebooks are uh, kind of visualizations of how they think. So obviously Mitchell is thinking a lot more with images, and Proust has all of this kind of insertion of like thought within thought within thought, which of course if you've read the novel, it is how it is. Um, and so there was a kind of visual form for the way that their thoughts were structured. Um, and I don't think even when I made these notebooks, I quite, I quite understood that I, or kind of, you know, I don't think I was, I think it was only the, at the beginning of that idea, um, and so maybe I have to do a whole new series, but um, I collaborated with a bunch of writers, um, just a bunch of writers, they were just around. Um, I had a, a good friend of mine who is a poet, Dan Majors, um, he had a group of friends who were um, uh, all poets in New York, um, and I had met them through various readings and things. And so I sent them just this really basic prompt, like, okay, it's summertime, you're, you're miserable, and, and so you're going on a road trip to somehow escape that misery. And, uh, and then they sent us back all kinds of writing, and uh, uh, which we edited into the things that would fit on one page. Um, so these are still collages. This is uh, writing by Farrah Field, um, and the collage, the text is all cut paper. Um, I, it's, a, it's laser cut. If you're curious, I can explain the process, but there's like 12 steps. I thought this will be way easier than cutting it out with an X-Acto knife, and then it was like I had to go to a special fab lab at a college and learn to use crazy machines to cut out all the text and then hand paint onto this cut paper. It was uh, probably a silly thing, but it was fun. I liked, I like nerding out with that stuff. Um, this is one that I wrote, which is why it looks like it's written by a 10-year-old. Um, and then this was one, there were several more than, than I'm going to show you, um, but just for time, I'm kind of breezing through. Um, this was written by Paige Taggart. It's twice as big as the others. They're 22 by 30. This one's the 44 inch size. Um, she wrote a 20 page science fiction story um, where the road trip was through space, um, which was very cool. And we had to basically edit that down into four paragraphs that don't mention space because um, that didn't really suit the project. Um, but I, I um, I loved working with so much of her kind of wild, raw information. Um, this is a series of collages that I made um, called The Renovations, and it's the, the first time where I made one, I, th I thought of this as one work um, that had all these kind of modular, modular components. Um, and so this is the first time that I had made something where there were many different scenes, other than books, that had many different scenes that added up to a single narrative. Um, before it was always kind of, they, were, they would be related in terms of subject or in terms of the age of the participants, but not necessarily as directly as this. Um, so this is the, the loose narrative I was working with is that a, a son goes to his father's cabin in the Ozarks and uh, tries to kind of clean it up and renovate it after the father is sort of gone. They, you don't know what, why he's gone or in, in, in what capacity. Um, and it's a narrative I come back to with uh, one of my animations, so we'll, I'll, I'll revisit that in a minute a bit. Um, by working modularly, I was suddenly free to do, to essentialize a lot of the images, to make them kind of more iconic. Um, and some could carry more of the narrative weight of having to kind of tell the story, um, while others could be more kind of shape-based um, or kind of associative. He's like pulling down his dust mask um, or, or this kind of dream-like image. And then this was the cover for that whole project. So this was a more like a three, three by three and a half, four foot painting. So a very large book. Um, and in addition to that, I made an artist book where I redacted a, a 200 page um, science fiction novel from the 1930s to tell a new story about a father and son that somehow it kind of by some weird alchemy wound up um, being very similar to the story that 
um, I had kind of loosely written for the collages. Um, and then that I had printed as a full color. Um, it looked like a little paperback novel, but it had images of all of the collages in it. And then all of these pages um, redacted with white out. So there, there it is installed. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, uh, because I have a bunch of video clips, I'm gonna breeze through this metal section, but you can, you can just enjoy the scenery as we go. It's a revisiting of the car later um, as a huge collage. And then here's the um, uh, newspaper clipping uh, about the stabbing. It lists their entire home address of everyone involved. Um, just, you know, in case you want to go and finish, finish the job. Um, this is the, a painting of the police report and then a painting of the engine of the car, which I was thinking about as kind of, it was like doing heart surgery on, on, the, on the sports car. Um, but just breezing past some of these. This is kind of the end of when I was having the collage in this. A lot of this is actually painted, and people couldn't tell what was painted and what was collage, so I, I, I realized I was just wanting to paint and, it, and kind of needed to let it go. Um, here's some of the uh, studies for that give a little bit of the sense of how they get generated. The top is from a photograph my dad took of the car, and the bottom is from a Google searched image for that type of engine. Um, okay, so uh, the rest of what I'm gonna show are my last two exhibitions at Zersher Gallery, um, with a couple of films I made in the middle um, that, that have only been shown in uh, group shows. Um, so this is from a show called Independence Missouri. Um, at this point, it's all, it's all painted and, and no, no collage. Um, and the narratives all revolve around uh, moments in my parents' life when they were living in Independence, Missouri. Um, my dad had a small auto, part, auto parts store there that sold, it was just a retail store um, that went out of business when a lot of the big box stores uh, op you know, came about. Um, and uh, this was imagining the view out his front window the, the morning after he closed. So it's got the going out of business sale, uh, paint on the windows. Um, and in the gallery next to that painting was this sculpture, and it's another sculpture with an interview inside, and so you can put on the headphones and hear him talk about the, um, the sort of birth and, and transformation of that business from uh, a kind of more ambitious, like a big structured undertaking to a more casual from home uh, kind of thing. So this is a painting of his home office in the corner of our dining room. Um, as, as I remember it, uh, my mother later was like, we didn't have those shelves, what are you talking about? Um, but you know, it's all composited based on what I can make make sense and what I can also, what I also need to do to make the painting work. Um, around this time, I, I suddenly became okay with George Brock. Like I'd always been like, yeah, I like George Brock, yeah. And then, then I was like, I, did you know that George Brock is awesome? It suddenly like clicked for me. Um, anyway, so this is his home, uh, home office. Um, um, around this time when I was building this body of work, I, I interviewed my mother also because I realized I had done all this work with my father and I had never interviewed my mother um, or only briefly and not in a way that got into any projects. Um, so I interviewed her about the first apartment she lived in um, when she left college and before she met my father. And it was the only place she ever lived alone. Um, and she's a fascinating person. She's, she was often the breadwinner of our family. Um, uh, when my dad was out of work, and she's always had the, the better, more stable job. Um, she's also the person who, came, who worked an eight-hour day and came home and made dinner every single night, um, which was just heroic and amazing to me. And now that I'm a parent, I'm like, how are you doing this? Um, so anyway, I was fascinated by this apartment where she lived alone because it was the, um, it seemed like somehow it would, um, I don't know, it would be like, walking into her mind or something. Um, so I interviewed her about it and kind of tried to get stories out of her. She, she, uh, unlike my, my father likes to tell stories, my mother's a very quiet person or very reserved. Um, she loves to be around people and to talk, but she won't, she's not a storyteller the same way. Um, so I ended up talking to her a lot about just what the space was like. Um, and so I made this, uh, it's, a, it's a large diptych. Um, each, pa uh, each piece of paper is uh, eight feet tall and six feet across. Um, and it's kind of me imagining being inside of her kind of headspace of the apartment. Um, and there, there it is installed. So it's a really um, big drawing. And like a lot of my work, it's populated with these small, these moments of kind of concrete detail that um, uh, are meant to kind of 
anchor the narrative. They're, they're the evidence, again, that, um, of things that have gone on that allow you to kind of understand the person who lived there, the, the, the kind of, uh, I, I like the, the term that they use in British procedural cop shows, which instead of evidence, they talk about traces. Um, and so I, I like thinking about the drawings being full of these kind of traces of, of it, you know, their inhabitants. Um, I also, during that interview, I realized that my parents met in that apartment complex. Um, and so I had to do another painting that was like my dad coming over uh, to my, my mother's house, or my mother's apartment. Um, and so this one is the exact same size as the drawings uh, that we just saw, um, except the point of view is just sort of shifted uh, to the right. And you see my father uh, in the door, framed in the doorway, the screen door on the left, and my mother reflected in the glass uh, on the right. So there he is behind the, the screen, which I squeezed out from a syringe, little squeezes of paint, and then painted him over it and then sanded it. There was a whole thing. Um, I, I kind of love that sort of thing. Uh, there she is with her, she had the haircut. What is it called, what it has a flip? Yeah. Look at, uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, <laughs> um, and on uh, my father's side, you see her Carol King record um, and on her side is his Rolling Stones record. Um, they're both smokers. They're both uh, Budweiser connoisseurs. Um, so my, my father frequently ends his email with, I'm going to go to the store and buy milk, by which he means a 30-pack of Budweiser. Um, in, that, in that same show, the one oddball, or the pair of kind of oddball works um, were two animations uh, where I animated a notebook, a notebook kind of coming into being. Um, and it was my version of trying to do that, here's the, here's the thinking happening, but it was also the first where I could really take a character and have them move around. Um, so I'm not gonna show any clips of that um, to save time, um, but it was the, my gateway into animation um, was just drawing with Sharpie markers and white out um, on notebooks and photographing it a bunch as I made changes. Um, and it also marked a big shift in how I was, I'd always done little thumbnail drawings for my paintings, but I started doing extensive storyboarding, and now I do it for everything. I do it for still works and, and time-based works. Um, I just kind of live in these tiny frames in my sketchbook. Um, so the, the first animation after that exhibition um, was uh, called Mark of the Wolf. Um, it's just under eight minutes long, and it's all done with Sharpie, ballpoint pen, and white out on little bitty pieces of paper. And I was between studios, so I, I filmed the whole thing. I drew it all and filmed the whole thing in my uh, living room uh, in my apartment in Brooklyn. And I turned the coffee table into a copy stand. Um, and it tells the narrative of a, a young man who goes back to the cabin in the Ozarks where the father has, uh, is either in a, like a nursing home or has died, and he just cleans out heaps of his garbage, you know, all these kind of heaps of garbage and beer cans, um, and then has a kind of strange hallucinatory sort of dream sequence. Um, so here are a few stills from that. Um, and I think I've done well enough that we, I can show you some clips. So here is, this is about uh, a three minute clip. It's just under three minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
He gets in the car and leaves. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, thanks. I'm not done yet. <laughs> um, okay. Um, that led to another film called um, Apartment 6F, uh, which was basically uh, me in my apartment building in uh, Lefferts Gardens. Um, after my wife leaves, last, last year she was teaching at Cornell, so she'd be gone for like weeks at a time. Um, and then that's where the autobiography ends, and the rest of the time is uh, like my version of Rosemary's Baby, um, just like hallucinations and stuff. Um, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip the clip on this one um, so we have time for the, the final uh, body of work. Um, but this is, how the, this is how the animation ends up. Uh, there's a film and then there's 54 paintings. Um, and I'm really interested in the way that the two uh, processes have a kind of reciprocal relationship where each does something different than the other and they can kind of sit together um, in the end. Um, and then my last show, which uh, just closed uh, in December at Zersher Gallery, was called Between the Days. Um, and uh, it, it, it marked a big change in how I was making my animations. Um, insofar as the paintings were significantly larger, and so I could shoot the close-ups on the larger canvases instead of always having the canvas correspond perfectly to the framing of the cinematography. The result in the painting were all these kind of interruptions and these kind of fragmentary edges, um, which I realized when I was doing non-animated paintings, I was doing, I was creating those edges anyway as a kind of solution for the picture, um, but it also generated lots of moments of time within the, the still canvas at the end. Um, the narrative revolves around a, a mother and her adult son who's living at home, um, and it goes through one day in their lives. Um, you see uh, him sort of clean up the remnants of her previous night, um, beer cans, emptying ashtrays, and then you see her go off to work um, at uh, a factory called Millbank, uh, which was a factory I worked at uh, when I was younger. Um, and uh, then uh, she comes home, watches TV, gets drunk, goes to sleep. He comes home and goes down in the basement and listens to black metal and, and uh, lifts weights and uh, nearly crushes himself under the bench press. Um, and, uh, but he's okay. So this is a seven foot painting. It's in acrylic and, and flash on, on stretched canvas. Um, and this is a detail. Um, I remember when my parents got the luxurious Home Depot chic uh, door, new front door. Um, framing all the different moments uh, in their kind of everyday lives are these moments of kind of transformative light and uh, kind of the everyday um, becoming these kind of phenomenal events of uh, generally of light. So the light streaming in through the front door, the light on uh, the character Carolyn's screensaver at work, um, things like that. So here is the son, his name is James. Um, he's not actually named in the film, but I had to name them so that they would be uh, more real for me. Um, it's a 22 by 30 inch painting on stretched canvas. Um, this is another one of James. So these, these are more directly corresponding to some of the shots. Um, also different from the previous animation is that once the, uh, the filming is done, I would go back into the paintings and keep working on them instead of stopping when the, the animation was finished. Um, so here's one of uh, Carolyn waking up, and it's another version of that kind of compression that happens in the reflection, the, reflect, uh, the reflection on the window um, that we saw earlier. Here she is right when she wakes up. I, she looks just ever so slightly like, like my mom, but mostly she looks like the mom from Friday the 13th, which is, was the model for this character. No one, needed, no one knows that, but um, now everybody does. Um, and so oftentimes when I'm animating them, the image that, you, that I paint on the canvas is <clears throat> more, more of, uh, it's more about being a picture. It's a painting for reproduction. And then after I'm done shooting it, I have to keep working on it until it can exist still. Um, and so things like all the geometry that are in, that's in this one, that where the, the ashtray becomes almost like a clock face, um, that didn't exist until months after the shooting was done. Okay, so I have a few excerpts. Um, each excerpt is, a minute to two minutes long, so um, tolerable. This is when Carolyn wakes up.
After he leaves the house, you see him just sort of drive here in park. So in order to make things, uh, so this is the painting after it was finished. In order to make things move, uh, in case it's not clear, um, I paint what looks like a completely finished painting um, and then take a photograph of it and then change one tiny thing uh, by a fraction of an inch and then photograph it again and do that 10,000 times and then it moves around. So like that train sequence was like 40 hours. Um, I'm just tiny. I was like, why did I do this? Tiny. I thought I'd be able to loop it, and then it would it would look fantastic. Um, I wanted to do the entire train car, um, or the entire freight train, which um, sometimes they have like 70, 100, or more cars. Um, but that <laughs> that was basically where uh, extraordinary fatigue set in. Um, I'm also doing all the sound and music myself. So the country song that's on Carolyn's radio is that's me. Um, <laughs> I know you can't believe it. Um, and that shredding you just heard. Uh, also me. Um, when, when Carolyn goes to work, she does kind of everyday things at the office. She writes a post-it note. She works on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, she takes a phone call. She goes on break and takes her cigarettes. Um, the, the result in making the painting, uh, I photographed it and filmed it in wide angle first and then shot all the close-ups of those gestures uh, after. And, uh, in the, and I would tape off the area where I'd be filming. And the results were these kind of fragments um, and the, the kind of pictorial evidence in the painting uh, points to Carolyn being Catholic, um, and I'm uh, I'm often thinking about uh, uh, that's kind of informing. I feel like once you're Catholic, it's just there. It's always you know, <laughs> waking you up in the middle of the night. Um, taste of church wine. Um, but uh, anyway, so I was thinking about the Frangelico. Uh, uh, painting, um, but I was also interested that there would be all these kind of uh, fragmentary moments, residual, left behind uh, in the painting. Um, and all along as I was doing all these drawings of severed hands, I kept thinking about sculptures. Um, and that led me to make a few sculptures in the show that um, that uh, use that. It, um, I, I really love uh, wood-carved uh, polychrome sculpture, uh, especially things that are sort of fragmentary or slightly broken. Um, so this was, I made a hand for each character. So this is Carolyn's hand. Um, it's called ash. It's uh, it's car it's foam. It's like insulating foam, polystyrene foam, and epoxy clay, and acrylic and flash, um, and wood. Um, and then this is James's hand. It's called ignition. It's him with his car keys. Mm -hmm. To that uh, 2005 Impala you saw earlier, the cars are always very specific. Um, so after you see Carolyn in her office, she goes to break and you see her sitting out alone at the break tables, um, where earlier you saw tons of employees all sitting together. So kind of the characters are always isolated. They're even isolated from one another. Um, and I promise I'm gonna be right on time. Um, so this is uh, the transition from the day sequence into the night sequence. You, you're kind of alone in the house. I was kind of thinking about like, what does the dog see when no one's there? Um, so anyway, I'm interested in these kind of roving points of view that don't necessarily have a human mind attached to them. So that's where this uh, clip comes from.
and scenes like that are, are uh, really inspired by, um, I, was, I was recently, I was teaching uh, Tarkovsky's film Mirror to my uh, a narrative class at Purchase, um, and we, were, we actually were drawing from it. We just played, I just kept playing a scene over and over and over again. We'd draw it again and again, and there are these scenes where cameras just sort of move through space, um, um, or where, where, where characters are even like figments, almost like of the imagination of the space itself. Um, so there's a character uh, in, in this scene um, the the son of the kind of Tarkovsky character is seemingly over at a neighbor's house uh, or neighbor's apartment, and um, and she's got this cup of tea, and then it turns out she's kind of like a ghost or maybe a figment of his own imagination, and and then the camera cuts for a, a protracted view of where the saucer, uh, where the bottom of the teacup was, and there's a moisture ring, um, even though the character has vanished, and he just stays on it for what feels like a hundred years while that moisture evaporates um, and you just watch it in real time and it's just like the most magical thing you've ever seen but obviously Tarkovsky just put a hot cup of tea down picked it up and then filmed it um, but because of the context and the way that he's framing it and that he gives things time to do that it feels like time becomes this sculptural thing that he can kind of manipulate um, so anyway I'm, I'm obsessed with that and uh, aspire to it it's kind of embarrassing to show this and then show another clip of my stuff um, Different tiers, uh, these, but we do what we can. Um, okay, I have two more excerpts, and then you're all you're all free. Um, okay, so uh, Carolyn comes home. She's already been watching TV for a while, um, and you. This is we have a little moment of montage of her drinking, and then um, my my retelling of a great episode of Law and Order. <coughs> It gets very dramatic then, but I couldn't let you deal with that. Um, so the, uh, this, this painting isn't as contrasty as it looks up here. There's actually all kinds of little subtle grays and stuff. Um, so this was the same painting that you saw at the beginning of the clip that was fully lit. And I had the idea, oh, she'll turn off the lamp and it'll get dark. And then I just will repaint the whole painting, everything in the exact same spot on the same canvas and make it nighttime. So I did that. Um, and it was a weird thing to do, but I, I I think you can see that in the painting when you see it in person. You see the kind of uh, these sort of skims of color over color over color of um, the thing having gone through and lived all this life. Um, so on the wall, you see kind of the whole um, patrilineage from you see dad and grandpa and uh, James, the high school graduate. Um, even though the you know most of that is not apparent in the film. Um, and here's a close up of Carolyn's remnants there. Okay, and this is the last clip. Um, I have a few I have two images after this. Um, so, um, but resolving this. So, after Carolyn staggers away, um, we have a little, a little uh, kind of that in between time where light is just happening and cars are driving by, um, and James comes in and goes downstairs to go and do the weightlifting scene. I can't show you the climax. It just out of context, it seems uh, weird. It'll seem hokey. So. You have to you have to see the whole thing sometime. It's available on Vimeo. Okay.
right, so there's how the basement stairs wound up. You can see again how different the geometry is now that it's kind of crystallizes. Um, and here's where the, the weight room ended up. So the weight room and Carolyn's office are both four by five foot paintings, and then the two views of the living room are seven and a half foot paintings. Um, and I tried putting severed hands all over this one too, but it's such a, it, it was it, it was so like macho, and there's already the kind of fragments of Arnold Schwarzenegger up there on the wall, um, that it just, it seemed bizarre. There, you can kind of, and you see it in person, there are the silhouettes of two hands uh, kind of gripping the, uh, the, the barbell there, um, but they're kind of buried under the paint. Um, but similarly to the, the office, it's, this image is kind of populated with these little bits of evidence so you can kind of understand uh, uh, who he is from kind of what he has and what he leaves behind. Um, all right, thank you.